Greetings everyone, I am Ozzy Arcane from Backlog Gaming, and with me today I have... Retrospective Gaming, how's it going everybody? And, uh, you know, we're here to do a collab, finally. Yeah, we're going to talk about Gateway to the Savage Frontier, though briefly I want to just mention some things about the Gold Box games in general, because this is a long-running series, there is a total of... I don't know if I should actually say long-running series, because it didn't last that long, but there were a lot of games in it. <laughs> there were nine games total, starting with Pool of Radiance in 1988, and the last two, which were Treasure of Sad Frontier and Dark Queen of Kryn, were released in 1992. So, across, like, a five-year time span, they released nine games in this series. Wow. And... Part of that way they are obviously able to pump those games out is because these games all have the ex exact same game mechanics. You can like you look at like one from the next, you can kind of see how they're re they recycled a lot of assets mm -hmm. and uh, stuff like that. But uh, we can talk more about various things as we get in with this. I think uh, I think the first thing we should probably talk about would be like character creation. I would think. Oh, and this was confusing for me. I think we, uh, I think I picked a good, um, well, I think you picked a good, uh, game to start off with because I tried playing Pools of Radiance before and I can deal with older games, but it was really confusing for me. So I couldn't even imagine what it's like to try to get through that game. Pool of but, Radiance isn't that bad, but the problem is the controls in the game are like way worse. <laughs> like, uh, you couldn't really use, like, you use the arrow keys to move, and aside from that, like, you had to use the hot keys to access each menu thing. You couldn't, like, scroll through it like you're used to in, like, a lot of things. And I'm sure you noticed, even if you turn the mouse on, it doesn't do a whole lot. <laughs> no, it's it it doesn't barely do anything. So, when you uh, messaged me about covering this game, I'm happy that you picked a a good point in the gold box games to start. Yeah, this is kind of like the center, so it's it, it, it like it gives you a good uh, starting point. I mean, it's it's closer to what you would expect from newer games than some of the first few were. <laughs> and um, you know, the thing starting off with character creation, it, it was pretty crazy because I'm used to you know I, I played like Planescape Torment and things like that, so I can I understand a little bit of Dungeons and Dragons, like kind of like the background. Like I haven't gone through any of the manuals because they're long as hell and it's confusing. But I'm sitting there and I and I and I start looking at it and it's like, you know, half this, half that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just everything's like going, you know, neutral and everything. And it's fine with that, but I've this is like I believe the first game that I like played where like you have to create it like right from the beginning. And it's your like whole you party, to... too. Yeah, it's, it's your whole party. It's not like in Baldur's Gate where you just make your main character. Mm -hmm. And e even though Baldur's Gate and Planescape Torment are also from the Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition rule set, they're far more fair in the way they set it up than they were in some of the earlier games, like the Gold Box games. Because I'm sure you noticed... I, I, I pointed this out to you, that... Generally speaking, if you're making a party in this game that you intend on carrying over to the sequel, you want virtually none of your characters to be something other than a human. Exactly, which is something that I did not know because uh, the half ones they have problems leveling up. And that's something that I didn't know. So my first party that I created this game, I literally had like, you know, half everything. Almost, because I, I tried following this one guide. And I didn't really know what was going on. So I had, like, you know, a Dwarven fighter. I had, like, half this, half everything. So then I had to restart it because I do want to carry this over to the next game. But, yeah, I didn't even know that. It's, it's so confusing at first. Yeah, because um, those that don't know, because you're obviously... Some of your viewers probably obviously aren't really into, like, older D&D &D either. So I, the thing is, everybody except for humans have level caps on classes, with the only exception being, for some reason, all of them have unlimited progression in the thief class, even though that's 
really weird because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that a dwarf can only get to level 9 as a fighter, but he can go as high as he wants as a thief. And I don't really picture dwarfs being the agile thief types. <laughs> yeah, that's weird too. I didn't even... I would not imagine in my life that a, a dwarf would rather succeed in being a thief than a fighter. Yeah. Like, the, the only real exception... Because you can also make multi-class characters. That's the big... One big advantage of... Of, um non-human characters is they can be more than one class at the same time like you can have a fighter thief or a thief mage or stuff like that the, so like the real only exception if you're if you want your party to carry over to the next game would be it would be it would kind of be okay to make like a elf magic user thief because if if they have max intelligence they can get to level 12 as a mage which is still really high and they can go up as high as they want as a thief, so it balances out a little more. So she goes, mm -hmm. in D and D, you get most of the spells you really care about by that by that level, anyhow. Oh, but geez. the uh, one thing I should point out is what we're talking about golden box games in general is uh, the Dragonlance games are a lot more fair in this regard because they don't have the exact same rule set because they had different types of dwarves and different types of elves and stuff. And in that, the dwarves could go up to max level as fighters and elves could go up however high they wanted as magic users. It's not like uh, in Forgotten Realms where they just use like the base D&D uh, &D rule set that's for like everything and had these specific restrictions in place. There, it, was a, it was a lot to learn coming from... Uh... My point. I see. At first, after I played Planescape Tournament, I thought I had the whole D and D thing basically locked down to a T. But obviously, going back to this game, I, just, I had to learn a whole bunch of new stuff on the fly. Which is, you know, one thing that I, I that I almost had problems with at first, and I remember as soon as I tried playing it, I'm sitting here like, when the fuck am I going to level up? Like, I see all my characters turning a different color. I'm like, okay, does that mean they're dead? When am I supposed to level up? And then I messaged you on, on uh, Discord because <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that. Because there's so many things that, is, that I take for granted because I've already played the games that I don't even think, oh, other people aren't going to know about this. Yeah. I was literally sitting there. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm looking at my... I'm like, I'm doing these, like, little fights. And I'm going throughout the world, and I'm you know, doing everything, and I remember after I beat these trolls, I'm sitting there like, okay, I have to level up now, and then I realized you had to go to the damn training hall, but so this was like a crazy experience for me, because even though, you know, people looking at some of my videos, I've played a lot of stuff that people would consider hardcore, obviously not hardcore enough, because <laughs> there's some games that goes even more in depth than what I think, and I don't know a thing about Dungeons & Dragons. Because usually with other games, like you said, Ozzy, it's more, you know, a little bit more streamlined. So, you know, you pick up party mates or you ju you can just pick stuff. Like, you really don't have to go in depth with all the rules, like your alignment. And in some games, none of that stuff really even counts. So, for this one, you had to, like, literally yeah. create a whole party and carry them. Well, in this, in this alignment doesn't really matter a whole lot, but if you... If you have a paladin in your party, you can't have anyone that's evil. That's like the yeah. only way it really matters. And you don't really have a reason to make an evil character because it doesn't affect anything. Yeah, that was weird. But yeah, I needed a paladin, so there was no evil characters in my party. But yeah, and uh, I, I think you might, you probably noticed this is, that this is, uh, even though this game is really old, they kind of had the thing going on where you, you customize your character. Like, you can create their sprite yourself with, like, the options. Yeah, that was... Which was interesting, but at the same time, um, it also means the char the player character sprites look way worse than everything else in the game. <laughs> That's true. I had... It looked like a, a little rainbow coalition, because I, I had to make everybody, like, different colors, because I had to figure out who was who on the battlefield. I didn't want them all looking the same, but... It makes for some really odd combat situations because when you're looking at everything else and then you look at your party, it just looks weird. It, it just they just look they kind of look out of place, especially if you have them in different colors too to try to you know keep them in to figure out who is who. 
That's the thing. That's why in a couple of the last few games, they actually, uh, instead of having you completely create the sprite, they had like a like a like a palette of sprites for you to pick from that were already pre-made that looked a lot better. <laughs> we needed that here. Yeah, because I mean, because this is this is also like we said, this game is kind of like the middle way point for the the these games. And they were still using the same character creation um, sprites, anyhow, that they were using back in Pool of Radiance. Well, and and Pool of Radiance had fewer class options. Like that, you literally could only be fighter, mage, thief, cleric. They didn't have paladins. They didn't have rangers. They didn't have any of that stuff in that. Wow, that is just. Oh my God! There's so much. There, there's so much more I have to learn. I kind of, I kind of thought I was like a big head honcho and playing old games. There is so much that I need to learn. Well, I mean, in this case, it's it's more of a issue regarding the Dungeons and Dragons rules themselves mm-hmm. than than old video game stuff. Oh yeah, just kept talking in a, like in an RPG sense, since you know Dungeons and Dragons really really did influence a lot of games, but. Going back to these uh, these games where they really try to implement the rule sets down right to the bone, it's 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 kind of tough, especially during uh, combat too, because there was some stuff that was going on that I was confused myself. Yeah, and um, you know the when you, you there's so many games where people will come up with like challenges for themselves, like they'll they'll be playing like Final Fantasy one and they're gonna they're like. You know, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do an all white mage run, or that. or an all fighter run. You ain't doing that shit here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a balanced party, or you're fucked. <laughs> exactly. Like I can't just having a paladin right in the front line because my my setup was the first two was gonna be the paladin and you know the 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 fighter. You know what I mean? The dwarven yeah. fighter. It was right there. I can't, like, I, I don't know how anyone could not have a paladin in their party because I would notice was that one of my characters, Jade, where, you know, she used a bow and arrow, she was, and then some of my other just main mages, if they, if the enemy even got their hands on them just a little bit, it would be, they would be done in like two turns. Yeah, you ha- you have to have fighter characters in the front line. So I mean, you know, paladin, ranger, fighter, those those three things. You have to have some of those in the front no matter what. And but, you know, in between them and the mages, you want to have your clerics because yes. they're beefier than either the rogues or the mages. And you have to have clerics because you need them for healing. Because um a lot of people that play RPGs go, oh, I need to get healed. I can just go to an inn and rest. You can't do that here. No. You need actual healing spells because if you if you go to an inn and just try to rest the damage away, you'll be sitting at that clock watching it go for a while because it has to, I mean, it, it spins by fast, but you only get one HP back for every eight hours if you're not using actual healing magic. And uh, I tried to be slick in some areas and try to do it right in the middle of the street because I didn't want to pay to one platinum. And I just got stopped by a guard like two seconds in. I tried every spot. I tried to go into a spot where I did not think they'd find me. Just one hour goes by and they're like, okay, you got to go. Yeah. But, and the Those money is in. only a real problem early in the game because when you get later in the game, you have so much money. You're like, shit, I got to put some of this in the bank. It's encumbering me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and one thing that was really new to me about the combat was at first when you see everything on the uh, like the battlefield or whatever combat situations happen like right from the beginning i'm sitting here like i have to like figure out who is who and you know catch casting magic missile and sometimes i you know, i have it on the target and they wouldn't do it and i'm sitting there well why is that and i forgot that they have to like charge it up or something like that the weight to oh, do yeah. it yeah and i'm sitting here it's just i mean for me a lot of the battles it, it wasn't as hard as i was expecting it to be there was, but there were certain battles where i had to fight trolls 
or I was just going right throughout the world and I get attacked by something and it really started to piss me off because I did not know what to do because I'm sitting here and I have my two I have my two, I have my dwarven fighter and I have my paladin like right in the front lines and you're just getting decimated and so I have to level them up but I don't have enough money to level everyone up le- yet because throughout the game you'll also get some like some MC- NPC characters that will uh, follow you at certain points in the game. And, and they're a pain but it's just in the ass. Lot. Yes, they are. Because <laughs> they, like, they, they won't let you do what you want with their money and their equipment. <laughs> no, they keep it for themselves. And, and you know, one guy, Krevish, he didn't even do anything about it. He just sat there the whole time in the back. Like, maybe he'd shoot an arrow here and there, but he was literally, like, useless. But he wants his, uh, like, fair share of the loot. <laughs> well, the thing is, I don't know if you – did you – one thing I meant to mention before before we really move on to the the combat completely was uh I don't know if you actually did this after I mentioned it but there is an option in when you're creating your party where you can pick modify a character where you can set yeah. their stats to whatever you want. Yes, I did do that and I I followed some guide on how to make and and I set it like for like certain things I didn't want to make them like OP you didn't want to give a fighter 18 intelligence because there'd be no point. <laughs> no, there'd be no point. Exactly. And I kept on rolling the dice. And I, I, I would just rather have it where you get like a certain amount of like skill points and you yeah. could... Because uh, rolling the dice, it just... You, you get like maybe one thing that you want, but then like as you said, you get a paladin that has like like 17 or 18 intelligence. You're like, well, why do I need that? I want to take some points away and put it towards something else. Well, well the weird thing about paladins is... Um, you know, classes have stat requirements in order to be that class. So you probably noticed the Paladin's Charisma never rolled very low because you have to have 17 Charisma to be a Paladin. <laughs> yeah, I would expect that. But, um, and, and everybody's probably thinking, wait, there, there's an in-game cheat? Well, that's not what they intended it for, even though that's what everyone used it for. I don't blame them. The intention was that you could modify your stats to be whatever you wanted them to be so that you could recreate your character from actual D&D sessions without having to specifically roll the actual right stats to get your character. But even if you boost your like your important stats to like max, there's still going to be points where you're going to get your ass kicked. Oh, definitely. Like I did that modified thing and I thought at first, I thought it was like a cheat. So I'm so I, when I first played the game, I'm like, oh man, I, I don't know. I'm not gonna have a good view of this game, so we can review it because I'm just gonna be OP. But that all stopped once I got right to the trolls. Did you, Did you realize there's actually a way to change the difficulty? Really? I, I forgot about this until we were you and me had been playing it for a while. But when you when you in camp, if you hit if you pick altar, which is where you would normally go to rearrange your party order there's a thing there that says like level that's the difficulty setting oh my gosh but the only thing it actually affects is the amount of hp the enemies have Mm -hmm. so i mean it's set on the like the middle setting out of like five settings (laughs) at the start so i mean anyone that puts that out to max is gonna have a bad time (laughs) i've been wondering if some people got confused doing that but uh, you mentioned trolls, so we can kind of... I just wanted to explain the modified character thing. But um, you mentioned trolls, so we can kind of talk about the combat. Um, troll mechanics, oh my god. This is like one of the most confusing things for them to implement in the games. Because they don't even implement it properly. Because I don't think they could figure out how to program everything to work the way it was supposed to. Those that don't know, trolls in Dungeons and Dragons are basically like giant uh, giant monster deadpools. They fucking regenerate no matter what. If you cut a troll in half, you better burn it. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that they regenerate no matter what. They cannot regenerate fire damage. Which is the reason that the shops in-game have items that are called flask of oil. People are supposed to have enough sense to figure out that they need to use those in combat to make it so the trolls won't revive. But nobody fucking does it. 
even people that no. know how to do it don't do it because it's a waste of time and money. I was wondering what the hell that was, and I was wondering why the trolls were giving me such a problem because some of the other fights I had, I mean, they weren't easy, but they weren't like yeah. extremely impossible. But, but but you'd kill a troll, and if the fight lasted too long, it would get back up. Exactly. And, and this I thing really started to rip my hair off when is, that happened. I like, finally got two of them down. In, in actual D&D, like, the rules pretty much state that like if you chop a troll's arm off and you don't like burn the body afterwards, you'll have two trolls. <laughs> like, the troll will regrow its arm and the arm will regrow a troll. Oh, man. In fact, I think that's actually I think that's actually supposed to be how they reproduce. Basically, they split into more than one troll. So we were supposed to. What they wanted us to do was get a flask of oil so we could just set them on fire each fight. Yeah, yeah. That way, that way, if you use a flask of oil on them, I'm pretty positive they don't get back up after you kill them. But the thing that's stupid is if you kill a troll with a fireball spell, guess what? It doesn't acknowledge that you use fire on it. It still gets back up. You know, there were some really just wacky things about this game because the, the troll stuff. But other than that, I was in, I believe the city was called Everland. And uh, they were having a, kind of like a celebration. And it it's, has something to do with the main, doesn't have anything to do with the main quest. But just randomly they're throwing like a celebration. And I'm wandering around the town and all of a sudden it says, oh, you've been attacked by Sturges. And they look like these little red birds, like red, red little dragons are flying. And I'm sitting like, where the fuck are these animals coming from? I'm like in the middle of the city, and they're all celebrating, and then I get hit by Sturges. Yeah, that was that. This is this is like the one gold box game I remember where, like, in a lot of the cities, there's just monsters and shit wandering the streets for no reason. I'm just kind of like, what the fuck is <laughs> everywhere? Like I don't remember, I don't remember any of these other games where it would be like that in like a regular city where you can use inns and stuff. Exactly, they're, they're having a, a celebration, and all of a sudden I'm walking around and I get attacked by these damn flying birds. Like, what the fuck just happened? Or, or in the, like the one town where there's like undead and barbarians wandering around the streets. Like, oh yeah, there's these, uh, there's these barbarians and undead. <laughs> Look out for that shit. Oh, okay. Guards ain't gonna do anything about it. Uh, all Good right luck. then. <laughs> but uh, and also, you already mentioned Krevish. Like, uh, I I didn't know about that character at all before going into this. Like, he he's a fighter, but you see his picture. He looks like a fucking wizard. Mm-hmm. Like he's like the most ironic character I think I've seen in one of these because he's a complete wimp. Like you look at his stats, he's yes. a wimp, but he's a fighter. Exactly. And he's he's in... he's actually got high intelligence and wisdom, but he's got terrible like strength and constitution and all that stuff. Was that like a? Jo I'm wondering if they there was a if that was supposed to be like a joke, like they were making fun of one of the guys working on the game or something. I don't know, but I mean, like later. Later, when you get, like, that warrior princess in your party, like, temporarily, she even makes fun of him for being wimp weak just because she <laughs> looks at him and is like, you're not going to do anything. Yeah. Like, One I, thing, it, that is crazy. I mean, that's funny. Krevish, you know, I, I don't know if he's comedic relief, but he sort of reminds me of, like, Myron from Fallout 2 because they remind me of the same way. Like, Myron, he, you know, he talks a big game, but during combat he's absolutely useless and – He'll start badgering you if you, uh, you know, you get into too many fights or whatever. But Krevish, instead of badgering you, he just sits back and takes all your loot. Man, he doesn't even talk a big game. He's just like every time he goes somewhere, he's like, I "Are you sure we should be doing this? I I'm yeah. kind of pissing my pants." Exactly. Yeah, just just sit in the back with your bow, Krevish, because if you attack yep. anything, you're just gonna break your fucking wrist. You know, one of the things, you know, speaking of gameplay that I was actually surprised with was um, I when you're traveling throughout the world and the cities, for for its time, I believe, I, I think there was a good amount of detail in the way everything was because when, I'm, when I was looking at the world map, it kind of reminded me almost of Darklands. Instead of like Darklands, you're, you see your, your party walking, but, you know, you have a little, you know, arrow going up and down, but 
there's a good amount of detail in the way everything looks. I mean, you know, when you're walking through the cities or you're, you know, walking through this big map and you see like rivers flowing and everything, I really was not expecting this. Yeah, I mean, it, it came out like with a gold box engine. Yeah, the maps do look uh, pretty good once once you actually figure out that, you know, the map scrolls. Like at first when I walked out the city, I was like, this can't be the whole map. <laughs> Because like yeah. most of them, uh, most of them I've played, you don't actually move around th like that. Like you go out into the wild, and the whole map for the area is on screen right away. But this actually, you know, you go to the edge of the map and keep going, and it brings up another area. Yeah, that's, and then figure out how to get the boat so you could travel to different places like Everlyn and stuff like that. I um. I was actually surprised with the the way the game looks. I mean, obviously, I, I can't talk about sound because there's literally nothing except for that one thing that you told me where the guy starts screaming. Yeah, you kill you, you <laughs> whenever you kill the enemies, you see like the skull and crossbones thing, and you just hear. Eee! Yeah, but yeah, I think that I think that they did a good job as with the with the visual aspects. I mean, the only thing that. About the gold box, and I have to ask you, since you know about these games, what is up with the fucking font? Oh, the fonts. I, the that font. I don't really know. I honestly don't. Because the font is just really weird to me. Like, I don't have a hard time understanding it, but I'm like, what is this and what's going on? I know for some people it's, it's going to be hard to read. I think it's just, uh, just a product of the time because of the whole... You know, this is from back in the times when DOS was still a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know why the font's like that, but um, since we're talking about how confusing uh, these games are, we might as well talk about the magic system. <laughs> I don't think I still have it figured out, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, mages and clerics, they have to memorize their spells before you actually go out and do stuff. So, like, when you're camping... They have to memorize their spells. They get so many spells um, for level. They, if you're, if you have high wisdom with a cleric or high intelligence with a mage, it increases how many spells you're allowed to memorize at a time. Mm -hmm. But the big thing is, is there are so many spells in this game that almost serve no purpose because they just wanted to throw everything from the rule book in there, and like a lot of these spells. In the context of the game, do next to nothing. Because the likeliness of you to actually need the knock spell are virtually non-existent. Yeah, it's a level I, 2 I, spell that unlocks doors. If yeah, you... I'm you just bash. I just bash yeah. a lot of doors. Yeah. In. If you if you have like a fighter in the front that has high strength, you're gonna you're gonna smash through every door anyhow. And failing that, if you have a rogue, they can pick the lock. Like knock is literally like the last resort if your the rest of your party just sucks. Yeah. Which, if I that's the case, you're probably not going to succeed anyhow. Yeah, I had no problem with that because I literally bashed every store down. And for me, you know, a lot of the times, using except for like tougher fights, just using magic missile was enough for me in, in most fights not all of them but in a lot of fights because I don't know I it's like I'm, I'm glad that they put everything in there but there's a lot of shit that you really yeah. don't need like there's a few specific spells that are that are real useful and like the rest of them you can basically ignore like you already mentioned magic missile like people make jokes about magic missile all the time but it is one of the most useful attack spells in Dungeons and Dragons because it scales for your level Mm -hmm. Every two levels, like it, it does one d four plus one damage, plus it an, an additional um, every two levels. So like level three, it would do, you know, it would be like rolling two dice for damage instead of one. But obviously, you don't deal with dice because this is a video game, so you don't actually mm -hmm. see the rolls that are determining the damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm actually, uh, happy. Aside from that, like for as far as level one spells go, the only other real good mage one is sleep. Oh yeah, that that one that, that helped me a lot too. It, it does like a, happy. It's like a 
like a nine square grid of enemies if they're all grouped together and you throw it in the middle of them. And the thing is, I'm really happy about the gameplay that you had to tell me because I was not figuring out. I am so happy that I actually you actually told me and I actually knew and figured it out that you, your dead body, like your dead friends, can get bandaged so they just don't sit there and die. Yeah, because if if you take if if an enemy's attack puts you at lower than zero, you will start bleeding out. And so you'll take one more damage per turn. And if you get to negative 10 health, which that includes if an enemy actually hits you for enough to take you to negative health while you're still, or negative 10 while you're still standing, your character will actually die instead of just being unconscious, which creates a whole other ball of problems because yes. your clear can't even get high enough level to learn race dead in this game. <laughs> Oh, you see, this is why, this is why I'm happy. I'm happy that you told me about this game because, to be honest with you, for for me to talk about this game by myself, I'd be uh, uh just going everything. I'm, I I, need, I needed you to help. I needed you to help me with this. So this is why it's good that we're collabing on this because there's a lot of stuff that I just figured out that what you told me right now and what you've been telling me throughout the the time we played the game. I'm sure you noticed that, unlike Magic Missile, sleep didn't really scale very well once you get to harder enemies. No. Like, it just does. It just stops working after you get to a certain uh, point. Exactly. Good luck. And, um, you know, w the, the level 2 tier spells are kind of like a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. it's like, as far as my, my choice, I always just pick Stinking Cloud. That's a good one. It doesn't have like long range, but it can incapacitate or debuff enemies when they're stuck in it. Um, and the rest of them from that level are just kind of hit or miss. And the obvious level 3 spell is Fireball. Oh, of course. You just got to be careful you don't blow up your own teammates. Yes. Well, oh, there's a lot of stuff. I, but Fireball, yes, I recommend using Fireball too. I, I like lightning bolt comes at the same level, but it's a lot harder to control because if you if you aim it at the wrong angle, it might bounce off a wall and come back and hit you. <laughs> like I actually watched the AI like kill half of their team, the the enemy kill like half of their team because they shot a lightning bolt at me when they had us backed right against a wall and like it it like downed two of my guys, but it like tore through like their entire group, hit on the rebound. Yes. Boy, that is some luck, huh? I don't, uh, that's awesome. I don't know if I'd say that's luck or if that's just really <laughs> badly programmed AI. <laughs> Did they all go ah when they died? Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that collectively at once? Oh, that's that like killing a group of enemies with fireball. If you have the the sound turned on, is like the most hilarious thing ever because because like it does the damage noise followed by them dying for like every single once will be like. Over and over again. <laughs> you know, and um, the thing is, like, the gameplay is really the meat of this game because, you know, story-wise, it's very basic. You know, your party starts off, you start off in some area, you start off in some inn, and they're all celebrating, and then you have to go out and, and adventure. And, you know, later on, when I'm not going to spoil much, later on after you run into some... Uh, people like Krevish and you have to help him out and you have to rescue this other guy going on, you know, you start to find out who the main enemy is and then it turns into like, you know, a basic hero game where, you know, you have to stop them. Yeah. So the gameplay is the meat of this game, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing going on story-wise. It's just this was, you know, back in the day where you had to read journal entries. So you get little tidbits of information throughout the game like it'll tell you to check Journal entry, something, something where they talk about a festival, or you see these guys come into town on horses, and you know they approach you, or something like yeah. that. And then when it says journal entry, it's talking about an an actual text that's in the actual physical book that was supposed to come with the game. Now, if you get the game from Good Old Games, they they do send you a digital copy of the yes. journal with the game. It should be like in the install folder, like it was for me. You might not have found it. But um, 
realistically, if you don't have the physical book, you're probably better off like printing the pages out instead of um, having to like minimize the game to look at it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. Or like with me, I, I checked out. I uh, I had a, a walkthrough. Not a walkthrough. This guy uh, print had all the journals on his uh, like his website or whatever, and I and I looked at it on my phone. So there is like you know the main stories like it eventually turns into oh you know you gotta save you know this one guy, but there are a lot of tidbits of information scattered throughout the world. Yeah, and I'm not I'm, I'm not sure if the journal entries are a result of them trying to save space, or if it was like an anti piracy thing. Did they do that with the other uh, gold box games? All the gold box games use journal entries for like a good chunk of the dialogue. And some of those journal entries are long, so it might also be they don't want you to have to keep hitting enter, 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 enter. Yeah, it it could be both because I noticed with the you know a lot of games like you know Darklands or Darklands, it sort of had the same thing, but not journal entries, but like a copyright protection where like like if you're you'll be playing and as soon as you get to a certain part, you have to like. Pick, what does this symbol mean? And it says like a letter, and you have to pick it. It did. It did something. They, these games used to do something like that. But if you if you have the the um, GOG versions, that part of the game is disabled. Like when you, it would be when you start the game up. They had this thing that was like a called a code wheel. That was like this little paper wheel that had two separate parts. You had to spin it to line <laughs> things up to get like a password to get into the game. Because they had all they had all these physical things to. Uh, make it so you needed them to play the game because back then with floppy disks you could literally just like make a copy of the game and somebody else could take the copy and play it if they if it didn't have all that kind of crap in place wow holy shit it's not like they did not have the level of copy protection on on like games that we do nowadays where it's a lot harder to just make a copy of a game Yeah, I um, you know, speaking of all of that, there was um, I really I had to sound also. I, unfortunately, I didn't get to hear the beautiful Oz, but with the uh, journal entries, I was actually surprised at the amount of info that they threw in about the world. Because when I when you're looking at it through like the main story point of view, you know, it's very simple as we said before, but you know, each town. You'll start, like, you know, whether they're celebrating something or you see knights come in or there's people that are getting robbed by somebody, you know. It's like, it's almost like they gave, like, almost a deep amount of detail with everything that goes on in almost every city. And I'm just, I was really surprised by that myself. Um, and with this game, it's kind of particularly needed because... Uh, the Savage Frontier games are like pretty much the only games out of the Gold Box games that don't tie into like these huge story novels they had in some way, like Pool of Radiance, Pools of Darkness, uh, Curse of Azure Bonds, and pretty much all of the Kryn games tie into the books in some way, but. Uh, Savage Frontier takes place in a part of the Forgotten Realms world that is virtually never talked about, aside from Neverwinter being there. Which, like, Neverwinter is kind of like the New York of Forgotten Realms. <laughs> but, like, and, and, like, you know, a lot of games like to use the name Neverwinter, but, like, um, most of them don't actually, uh, explore the surrounding area at all you know now obviously if you know like since ozzy is you know used to these type of games because he literally has all the physical stuff too so that's pretty cool and me i have a, I have a you know for like a younger guy i have a bigger tolerance for older games obviously since this game came out in the early 90s there are things that, you know, for a lot of newer players that maybe would want to play the game, they're gonna, there's some hurdles that they get to go through. There's some outdated stuff, like especially, you know, with inventory management. You know, you have to, you know, click yes and no for all of your characters to, you know, whether they could equip a weapon or, you know, you have to click every single individual item, you know, to get it into your thing. And there's different type of gold and things like that. But for me, 
it wasn't as outdated as I thought it was. I mean, yeah, you know, inventory management and, of course, some of the way the, you know, the menu looks. Obviously, if I, I, I prefer it being updated, but there wasn't, it wasn't like anything that really made me had to really like really struggle to get through because what I another game that I played was like Wasteland and that came out I believe three years before and you know a three-year difference Gateway to Savage Frontier actually has a modern interface compared to what Wasteland from 1988 had because there was a chore to get through especially you know with the combat and the text scrolling up and down so there are some hurdles, you know, especially with the inventory management to me being the biggest hurdle. You know, you're going to have to micromanage every single item that you get. And especially when you go into a store, but it's not bad for me. Yeah. And the uh, huge part of that micromanagement with your inventory also is based off of each character's strength because that determines how much they can carry. It's not like you can carry this many items and that's it. Like, you don't you don't actually see all the things that are affecting how much you can carry because obviously plate mail weigh, uh, weighs more than leather armor. Mhm. Mm so that has its weight value that you don't see it but like you know as far as as how a normal inventory in a game would work it's like imagine if like plate mail took up like five times as many inventory slots as leather armor. <laughs> oh yeah. Kind of like imagine it from like a Diablo standpoint where you get to see yeah. how many spaces it takes up. I understand. And it was kind of hard for me to figure out too, like the weight of everything and how much my characters could carry. So I just had to do a trial and error and just, you know, which, how many can they hold until it tells me they can't do it anymore? Even for me, it's like that because you, you can't actually see like so, the statistics that really determine that you just kind of you can just kind of like guess but that's really all you can do about it yes but yeah like you know speaking from like a you know a younger you know someone that's used to more modern games as I said, it wasn't really more it wasn't as outdated as I thought it was like traveling through the map was fine you know sometimes you may need to get a boat to travel to certain areas but it it was very easy, you know, go to this area, you know, you have to scroll in, there's a next part of the area, and combat was, I mean, obviously, you know, it's outdated, because you see, like, you see these characters, they kind of look funny, and they're moving around, and they're shooting stuff at each other, and they're kind of moving, but I think it's, once you understand even a little bit of what D&D has to offer, like, if you look up the manual, or someone's there to help you, like, thank God Ozzy did, it's, Except of certain few fights, cough, trolls, it's. I, I think it's easy to get the hang of. I think what a lot of people, when they don't want to like play these games or they don't want to understand them, I think it's more of like these certain barriers that we have been used to in modern gaming for a while. And I can understand some of them, but what if you're interested in this game, I would recommend either looking up a playthrough or just trying it out for yourself. Or use game facts. They got yes, really, they facts. got really good maps on there to make up for the in-game um, area maps sucking horribly. And you're going to need that because the in-game map is, as Ozzy said, it is absolutely terrible. It does not throw you a bone. It, they just better, they're just better off just not putting it in and tell you good luck. Yeah, better off taking it out because you don't, you you basically, you you it basically looks like graph paper when you take first take a look at it because. You you see like you see the walls the lines where the walls are but it doesn't the map does not show you where the doors are. Oh yeah, so you're like literally moving around, and I, I don't I, I don't know what the hell's going on. Which I mean at the same time this this probably was one of the first games that tried to have like an in-game map like that. I mean this this series not this game specifically, but um, it, it's still like when you're used to. The way maps are in other games, it's it's very confusing. Like even for me, as someone going that for me going back to these after having played them before, the map is the absolute worst thing about it. Especially when you know you've been spoiled by like modern you know technology when it comes to video games, and the maps literally like even to a fault. Like certain games are literally 
put a dot in there and tell you, listen, this is here. Just move this to this step. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, the combat, the, the actual combat isn't really that outdated, the way the way the combat works, not maybe the all the mechanics involved with it, but the way you move around the battlefield, you could easily compare that to something like um, Fire Emblem, yeah. as far as how you move around in the combat, but... Look at it's, it like a it's the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. They, you know, you brought up a good point. It's, it's exactly like if you play like these older, um, not older, but anyone like a what do you call it? Fire like a real time strategy game. It's a turn based mm. strategy. More turn based like, but... strategy game. Excuse me. I yeah. This is basically you know you pick, you tell them to move somewhere. You tell them to fight this and that. So it's it's very easy to get into for me. Yeah. Although one 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 thing I didn't we didn't mention while really talking about combat that I think I should mention that I'm actually not sure if you realize is there are some enemies in these games that can only be hurt by magic weapons. I you, you know the only ones I can think of in this that are like that are margoils. If you might have noticed if you didn't have a magic weapon equipped and you hit one of them you'd do zero damage no matter what. You know, I've. You know, sometimes when I play these games, there are certain things that I forget, and there are certain like fights that I I should remember it. You know what I mean? But then I just you know do a trial and error where I just equip them with different things, and then like either beat them and just forget about it. I've totally forgotten about those enemies. But yeah, you 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 kind of need to get like magic weapons as soon as possible in the gold box games. Uh, this one's actually kind of less forgiving in that regard because a lot of them you only find as like rewards for completing certain tasks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you're fighting like in this, there are things called margoyles. They're basically gargoyles without wings. If you don't have a magic weapon equipped, you can't hurt them. Nope. Unless you cast a spell at them. I mean, that's yep. still magic though. Exactly. So that's how that's how I got through a lot of my um. The Margoyle fights was I let the um I don't there's not a good strategy so I don't recommend doing it but uh, uh I was literally just um, trial and erroring throughout the game like half the time I would just sit there and let my um tanks take the heat while you just cast you know cast the the the, the clerics do their um their offensive magic yeah cause light wounds yes cause light wounds which in the beginning. I did not understand the importance of cause light wounds until I got to the middle of the game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's it's cause light wounds isn't like super important because I mean, you know, in order to memorize it, you have to choose not to memorize the healing variant. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it is nice to have extra offensive magic if you really need it. Yes. But yeah. Um, before we really, really dig into talking about the story, I think uh, already you already briefly mentioned this. There's there's no fucking sound in this game. No. Like uh, there's the intro tune that it plays when you boot it up. And that's it. Yes. And you'll get the ah maybe, but you can yeah. just have it on mute the whole time. That's that's the that's the case with a lot of these games. Some of them are a little better about it than others. Like, I, I think, I remember the, uh, the Crim games did not have persistent music, but I think, uh, Death Knights of Crim is, is when they first started doing this, where, like, before, like, a major encounter, they'd have, like, a special little tune that would play. But in this, there's fucking nothing. Nothing. So, you, we, we don't have to talk about that, because there's nothing in there. Yeah. Like, I mean... If we were talking about like uh, the NES version of Pool of Radiance, we could talk about it. But which is actually how I got into the Gold Box games was because of the NES version, which is aside from the music, is kind of inferior to the PC games in like every way. <laughs> because you go from having a six-man party to a five-man party for some reason. I don't know if that was like a system limitation thing or what. Hmm. I would wonder. I would like to look that up one of these days. But, uh, yeah. So we can't really talk about sound because there isn't any. Uh, as we always already mentioned with the story, there a lot of it is covered in these journal entries. And, um, obviously, we're, we, I, I think 
I think you're like me, where you try not to like seriously spoil the story for people. Mm-hmm. But um, anyone who actually knows anything about about Forgotten Realms have probably heard of the group that are the main villains in this, which is a group known as the Zentarim. You find this out really soon in the game. It's like right after the first major quest. Yes. Um, the Zentarim are an interesting case because of the fact that they're they're like one of the only real military powers in the Forgotten Realms world. I mean, you have like some Dungeons and Dragons settings like Dragonlance where you actually have a good army and an evil army that are going at it. Here in Forgotten Realms, there's kind of the Zentarim and everyone else just kind of hopes the Zentarim don't kill them. <laughs> Like and one of the only one of the only things that really kind of stops them from succeeding a lot of times is they're one of those groups that have like a lot of infighting. Because I think even in this, like at the beginning, um, like one of the people you fi- that you were trying to find was actually a member of the group that was trying to stop them from doing something. Mm-hmm. Because they they have like constant power struggles because there's the priests of Bane. Which, uh, I don't know how much you know about Forgotten Realms Lord. Do you know who Bane is? No, I don't. I don't know anything about Bane. Well, you've played Baldur's Gate, right? Yes. So you know ba- who, you know who Ball is? Yes. Um, Bane is one of, like, the three major evil gods for the Forgotten Realms uh, world, along with Ball and Merkel. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. Like later on in like the Forgotten Realms lore, there was a part or point where all three of those gods died. In fact, that was kind of part of the story of Baldur's Gate because of people trying to gain that god's power. But um, but the weird thing is like right like I've actually don't really play like newer Dungeons and Dragons, but all of their all those three gods' powers got absorbed by another guy later down the line named Kyric. But Bane is such a badass evil god that he came back from the dead. He's in modern Forgotten Realms. What? Really? Yeah. He's, so he, he's... He, he somehow... His essence somehow freed itself from uh, Kyric, which was actually his son, which is probably how part of how he did it. But Bane is back in like modern Dungeons and Dragons. So, I mean, this is like an evil god that's kind of very pivotal to... Forgotten Realms. And his priests are like a huge part of the Zentarim. But then there's also the mages that don't like the priests because the mages don't get their magic from a god. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really interesting. I, I really have to look into more of this lore because I was wondering what the Zentarim was because, you know, throughout the st- story of Gateway to Savage Frontier, once you do with a certain amount of things, like, you know, you go to Krevish and then you have to rescue this one person that really has all the info on how to stop them. I always wondered what they were and why are they such a threat? Why are people so scared of them? Why are they treated like such this, well, you know, mean, force? I mean, you look at the, you look at this game and how you actually meet, like, several kings in this game. Right? You notice that? Mm-hmm. But notice how, for all intents and purposes, those kings felt like they might as well have been mayors. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're, they're a king of this city, and, like, they don't even have a proper army, because, you, you know, there's, there's a couple cases where, like, their, their daughter is kidnapped, and they're like, oh, fuck, what do we do? I don't know. Well, you're I mean, doing a real good job of ruling this place. Exactly, like exactly, like I've I've noticed that too. So I mean, and that's like maybe we should ask for help. Th- that's why everyone is so afraid of the Zentarim is because they actually have a proper military. And that's what I was really confused with until you put it into more perspective. Because as as soon as as soon as you rescue uh, this um this um mag- magician or whatever, and he tells you about how the Zentarim is, I'm sitting here wondering, like, okay, we have how many cities in this damn world? You're telling me that none of these people can like combine forces into an army. Like it has to be up to us to stop them. With 
barely any help. And, and the thing is, their their base, which is this, uh, is a place called Zental Keep, is actually really far away from uh, this area, which is why they need magical artifacts to get down there in force. <laughs> Because mm-hmm. they got, they technically have to go across a desert otherwise, and even for an army, that's not a good idea. <laughs> but like, if you if you want like some idea of what they are like in regards to like the rest of the world, the thing is, uh, they're such a powerful evil organization that their activities sometimes keep other evil groups in check. Like, because they're in they're in pool of radiance as well. Because the the town that you start in in Pool of Radiance, which is Flan, is actually like a neighboring uh, settlement to Zental Keep. Like it's not that far from there. They're they're both along the same lake. So okay, put this into like a different perspective. If there was like, let's say this is a uh, you know New York City, and you know back in the day when the mob was running thing, there'd be different families, but the Zentrum would be like. The one keeping everybody, you know, in behaving. Yeah. yeah. Because the main villain in uh, Pool of Radiance, even though he basically uh, mostly has control of the city, which is kind of the objective in that game is to take care of him, but his power hasn't expanded beyond Flan because he'd have to go past Central Keep to go anywhere else. And like, even though he's got a bunch of orcs and shit, he's not going to go and try and fight the Zentarim. Wow. That's crazy. Holy shit. So the the entry that um, you told me and, and we started playing was the one where we deal with one of the, mo- one of the more badass armies in the, uh, the realm. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they're, they're at least mentioned in almost all the Forgotten Realms uh, gold box games that I can think of, because like I said, they're, they're, they're like I said, they're virtually the only military power in in uh, in the Forgotten Realms. I mean, there's obviously people that can do stuff about them because there are a lot of powerful people that don't necessarily need an army to get things done. So I mean, obviously they're like um, ah fuck, I cannot remember what the name of the town is where like Elminster basically lives, but like. They're not going to go there because he's going to cast Meteor Swarm at them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, um... I got to start playing the other games. Or at least look up the, um... Like a general, like, uh... Synopsis to, uh... Yeah. Get the idea. I mean, in, in Pool of Radiance, you actually go into Zental Keep at one point. But, like, it's it's kind of like with Neverwinter where, like, it's supposed to be this huge place, but you're really only in, like, a small portion of it. Wow. But yeah. So Ozzy, I have a I have a question for you. Yeah. Now, as you know, since you're used to the um these type of games and going back and playing this game, I believe it was for the first time for you, right? Yeah. This is the only one that I had not previously played before. I played the sequel, which when I got it I didn't know was a sequel. <laughs> so di- how did you like how did you enjoy it? What what do you like like overall thoughts on it. Like, did you uh, enjoy it? There's a lot of things about this one that I f- actually find kind of like weird compared to some of the other ones. Because, like I said, it takes a while to actually get like a decent set of magic equipment in this. And because I'm like, you know, like even like when you're getting close to the end of the game, you still got characters that like might not even have a magic item equipped. Like, um, for instance. I named my ranger after you, and I decided he was going to use a two-handed sword. Guess what I have not seen a magical item of? <laughs> and uh, it's funny, because I named my dwarf after you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I named my mage after myself, because, you know, arcane. It goes with the profile picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you mentioned trolls. Well, the thing is, like... You you slam into that brick wall like really fast in this game because like yes. I remember, in like compared to like Pool of Radiance in that, you know you got to clear monsters out of the slums and you'll maybe run into like two trolls in there at the most. Here you take a wrong turn 
and then like out in the wilderness you're fighting five trolls and you're like what the fuck happened how am i supposed to win this it it could be off putting it definitely could be off putting for i like if someone that's used to the games or someone that's new to them like me because you're right you it's like as soon as you opened your door in front of your house and as soon as you're going to bam you get hit by a wall yeah, like That's I don't it. remember, I don't remember any of the other games like having like a you a, a situation where you can just like slam into something like that that you weren't expecting. The like, difficulty spikes are odd in this game. Like, uh, which also, you know, fair warning, if you're just if you're just past the second town and you're walking around, I mean, you might be able to beat trolls, but if you see cockatrees, fucking run. <laughs> They'll turn That's you to stone, and you won't have enough gold to get the the spell undone. Yes, I've uh, flee. Like I, I, I saw that save. and I was like, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I can probably kill them before." Nope. Yeah, um, I just it's really odd with sort of like the difficulty spikes and in, in certain aspects, it's you know it wasn't hard all the time for me, but I just have the trolls and those damn things that turn you into stone and and that's in the wilderness, and then you get to the exactly. town and everything there is easy by comparison. Exactly. I was like, "What the hell." Like who who designed that part of the map? I, just, they, I think they were rushed. <laughs> just I, I they might have. I swear it was like they said, okay, with difficulty spikes, with enemies. I just felt that he had like a separate screen going on. And he just picked, okay, whatever. I pick a random creature, put him in this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot. Cause it's really odd how all that works. Like yeah. you know, you want you know you would want to see like a different progression of maybe getting. Whether the game starts off really hard and over time it gets a little easier, or the game starts off really easy and it gets really hard, but this one is kind of like a fucking mixed bag. Yeah, because because like actually just just pointing out how how things in the map are laid out is you start in this one town, you go over to this area, you find out stuff you needed to know, and then they send you back to the town. But in that first area they send you to, there's there's trolls and cockatrices over there. You go back to the first area, they send you to someplace else where the only things you run into on the path are like freaking goblins. I was like, why am I fighting goblins after I've been fighting trolls? Because this, <laughs> this is like, I just, I, I, all, a goblin, all I gotta do is look at him and he'll fucking die. <laughs> Especially after getting all the levels I got off of fighting trolls. Yeah, it's, it's wild. It's, that's definitely weird. That's one thing I did notice, and I'm happy, I'm happy you went more in depth about it, about how really don't come into this expecting like a sense of, uh, I'll, I'll use the term difficulty progression, because you're really just going to, it's really just random. You're going to run into a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> And you you mentioned you mentioned that like you know early on you sometimes don't got enough money to like pay to level your characters up. Like I was when I was playing this, I, I you know I was having an issue too, which I wasn't really used to having in these. But like I'm like I, I tried farming trolls in the wilderness to get gold off of them because I noticed they kept dropping large amounts of gold. I was like, ah, I'll kill trolls, I'll get more experience, and I'll get gold. And then I ran into cockatrice and I got turned into stone. <laughs> Yeah, oh my gosh. Which I don't even understand why trolls had gold in this. There's like so many enemies that they just decide not to have money because they wouldn't actually be carrying money like owl bears don't carry mm -hmm. money. But then the trolls have money. I'm like, where they don't even wear pants. Where are they keeping it? Exactly. Like am I am like, I am I getting gold that they that they devoured when they ate somebody? I, I I would I would expect or that or they want us to be masochists like oh yes you kill all these enemies but you won't get no gold to level up if you really want to grind you have to pick these annoying enemies that can beat the shit out of you and near them there are enemies that could turn you into stone and ruin the whole game for you yeah good luck yeah that was that was I don't want like. I think it. I think it's because the way the map is set up, you end up having to go back over in that direction later in the game. But like, at the same time, when they know you got to go that way at the beginning of the game, they shouldn't have monsters like that there. Yeah, I um, there is definitely some issues with um how they laid out everything, to say the least. So it's it's like. As you said before, you you'll walk straight into a clusterfuck, and then the next step you take is literally the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Um. 
talking about the story though, uh, another there was another group in this that I thought was kind of interesting because uh, they're actually kind of unique to this area, so you don't like hear them mention in any of the big stories. Was uh, the Kraken? Yes, a bunch of uh, idiots that worship an actual Kraken. Yes. Like, those guys, like, you don't hear them mentioned in anything, because I think this is, like, really the only area they're in. Um, and I, I know, like, there's a point where, you know, you're dealing with them, and you actually have to fight, like, giant squids. They're not krakens, because if you actually fought a kraken, you'd be fucked, but... Mm-hmm. And the kraken, they do play they do play a part in the story, even though... They're not the main villain. They're not they're, the main. They're, they're, they're competent. They're like a... Uh, insignificant thing. And of course, because a large chunk of the the story takes place near the sea, you run into a lot of freaking pirates. Yes. But, uh, yeah. That that was always, I thought was weird, because like, there, there are a lot of other evil groups in, in the um, Forgotten Realms that that don't get like a lot of mention because they're not the Zentarim. <laughs> <laughs> like the the other one I can think of that's like really big that you hear a lot about is like the cult of the dragon, and I think they're really only popular because they make dracolisks or, or dracoliches. Is what I meant to say. They make giant skeletal dragons. Oh yeah. Well, that could definitely be a, a positive point for a lot of gamers nowadays because dragons are the. Uh, in thing with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Although, if you, if you really want to see a lot of dragons, play Dragonlance. <laughs> yes. Which is maybe the, um, maybe something we have to cover uh, in the future one of these days, because um, I have not... I've never even heard of Dragonlance. Like, I've heard of Polar Radiance and uh, the other sequels that came out. And I've heard of uh, Treasure of, you know, Gateway Frontier. Something like that. Treasure of Something Frontier. Well, I mean, you 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 played you played Champions of Kryn, didn't you? Yes. That that's a Dragonlance game. That's a Dragonlance. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, that's the first one in the trilogy. You know, with um, with the Kryn, I've they when they put all the games on GOG like a, a while back, like a year, I played it for like three hours because I wanted to review it. Then I sat there. I said, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'll move on to something else, and I never touched it again. But yeah, um. Because it it's called Champions of Kryn because Kryn is the world that Dragonlance takes place in. It's like Forgotten Realms. There's actually a name for the world, but it it escapes me at the moment, so I'm gonna sound less knowledgeable than I should because I can't think of what it's called. Like I oh. know the area most of it takes place in is called like uh, Farren, but that's that's like a continent. That's not the actual name of the world. Wow. Man, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff to figure out. Yeah, and there's a lot of D- different D and D settings because you got you got Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, Greyhawk Adventures, Ravenloft, which really like Ravenloft would be good for people that like shit like Vampire the Masquerade because it's like nothing but like vampires and werewolves and undead. <laughs> oh, Ravenloft! That was a game that came out like a couple years later because I remember that in another game called. Now I'm gonna butcher this, like Met Soldier Baron. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, I have no idea how yeah. to pronounce it either, but I know what yeah. game you're talking about. Exactly, because I got both of them in like a, I think they're both like in separate packs or like a, a combined in one of the GOG re-releases. And uh, if you're hoping that we'd get the name right, well, I'm never pronouncing that name right, so don't count on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you have any, uh, final, final thoughts you want to cover? Well, final thoughts is for me, like, uh, for any, like, newer gamers out there that want to try this, as we explained before, there are some roadblocks, there are some issues with, like, the difficulty scaling, how it can get really hard to real easy, just like a mixed bag, and of course, since this game came out, like, almost 30, well, yeah, 30 years ago, that there are some menu stuff with the especially micromanaging every little thing with your especially with your inventory so that is a roadblock but overall to me i enjoyed the game i enjoyed it i thought it was a good game it's something that i was not expecting to enjoy when i first played it because i didn't understand what was going on but 
couple things that you need to do if you want to play it. Have the damn journal entries ready and uh, look, have some knowledge about D&D. But yes, I, I give I give it a thumbs up. I recommend you I recommend you try it out. It's on GOG now. I obviously give it a thumbs up as well. But uh, I and in the future I am planning on making more in depth like guides for the gold box games in general that I'm gonna do on my channel to like make things easier for people that wanna try these games because there's so many things about them that are confusing if you're just going in blind. Yes, definitely. This was definitely an in-depth review that of a game that not many people covered. And I have to say, this is 70% thanks to my man, Alzi Arcane here, my boy, because he knew a lot about the stuff that I, it would take me forever to figure out. So, you know, if you're watching this on my channel, check the link in the description and check his channel out because he has a knack of going very in depth and especially a lot of information about games that you're not going to see from many other people. So definitely check them out. And uh, if you're watching this on my channel, I will have a link to retrospective gamings channel in the description for anyone interested. And, uh, he covers old school games more often than I do in spite of me being older than him, which, uh, I've the, it'll, it'll keep you, It'll keep you more sane. <laughs> <laughs> you got to play old games with how trash a lot of the newer stuff is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it, it, it's definitely, um, there's definitely going to be a resurgence of uh, people playing older games, especially with all the bullshit that's going on nowadays in industry. All right. So, uh, for everyone watching, that is it. So, until next time, happy gaming. Have a great day.